punched me at the back of the head and then they punch you here in the kidneys and they kicked me in the shins. I heard that myself with numerous other people in the Dubai in prison, you know, with no food, no water. And then he was handcuffed behind his back and they wouldn't let her out of the room either. They also then um, essentially sexually abused me, um, raped, if, if you like. That they uh, hurt his head uh, on the ground, on the concrete, and um, that had led to his death. And many of these individuals, when they're finally released, they've been through such an appalling system of abuse. And I still don't know why they did it to me. I still don't know why. The United Arab Emirates, UAE, and particularly the Emirate of Dubai, has been famous among Britons during the past two decades for being the land of the permanently shining sun. It is also a promising investment environment. Many businessmen started setting up projects there in order to benefit from investment concessions, and many employees headed there dreaming of fantastic tax-free salaries and a more luxurious lifestyle. Before I went, I mean, I, I looked at Dubai as, a, as obviously a growing and developing city. This is 10 years ago. Um, and one which was, and this is an important word, one that was safe, one that was cosmopolitan, um, and one that was rapidly growing with a lot of energy, a lot of buzz, and where people of all nationalities, religions, races, would be welcome. The first time we went there was in October. And I guess the impression was, well, what the weather's like here, it's brilliant compared to Scotland because it wasn't too hot. We were regular visitors, never experienced any problems. And basically over the next three years, we probably visited five or six times. Yeah, before we went to Dubai, you know, it was um, sold to us on the TV, you know, the big, the big lights, the, the lovely city, the, the culture. The, the wealth, you know, and, and obviously the sun, which was appealing to us. Um, I'd been working at Heathrow Airport for many years. I had a lot of airline experience and I knew it would be easy to get a job with uh, Emirates Airline. Um, and I really wanted a change of scenery and some sun. So at the time, um, I personally just knew it was warm and sunny. <laughs> في أن نتنفس أكسجين في دولة الإمارات نقي بسعادة. الميثاق الوطني السعادة والإيجابية أكد التزام دولة الإمارات على موضوع السعادة والإيجابية أنها تكون أسلوب حياة وتكون الهدف الأسمى العمل الحكومي. We have sought to unravel the UAE's secret as a state of happiness from a Western angle, far from its controversial role in countries such as Egypt, Yemen and Libya. We chose to investigate Britain, whose government's Arabic spokesman Edwin Samuel hails the Emirati model through his Twitter account. According to the British Foreign Office, more than 100,000 British nationals live in the Emirates, and about 1.5 million Britons visit the country annually. Initially, it would seem that these Britons receive VIP treatment as European citizens. However, we have been surprised to discover the contrary. <laughs> تنظر إلى الأمارات ودبي وأيضا أبو ظبي كشريكة 
شريكة لتحديد السياسات والحكومات في العالم والحكومة البريطانية تثق في هذا المشروع التحديث وهذه القمة اليوم For many Britons, the Emirati dream became a hateful nightmare. There is no difference between an ordinary employee and a business person. Many found themselves subject to detention and interrogation by the authorities for various reasons. They endured treatment that can only be described as torture and a violation of their human rights. We travelled to different British cities in pursuit of the stories of these victims from England in the south to Scotland in the north and beyond Britain from London the capital to the Swiss city of Geneva. We traced a large number of former and current prisoners of the UAE. Some of them left prison after incurring much suffering and being subjected to severe torture. Some are still held behind bars and others have lost their lives. The UAE is marketed to foreign investors as a safe and exciting place to invest and, and, and people are lured in with the, with the excitement of wonderful projects and opportunities that might not be available in other countries. Um, and as soon as a company does become profitable, um, it is quite likely um, and common, very common, for the partner in the company to create false allegations, false and malicious criminal allegations against their partner. And some of these allegations have actually led to a conviction and sentencing of, of a business partner. Because in the UAE, evidence is not required to secure a conviction. Persuading Britons who suffered imprisonment and persecution in the UAE to talk to us was challenging. A wall of silence and confidentiality encapsulate these sorts of issues within British society, especially as many of the individuals we wanted to interview were undergoing therapy to recover from what they suffered. For this reason, we widened the search to include other countries, starting with a famous British person, David Haig, who we went to meet in the Swiss city of Geneva. David Hay is a former manager of Leeds United Football Club in England. He is also a businessman. He never imagined that after settling in Dubai for about 10 years, he would one day be a torture victim inside a UAE prison. Prior to going to UAE, he joined GFH Financial Group with a joint UAE and Bahrain investment, which had bought Leeds United Football Club. In 2014, David returned to Britain to undergo stomach surgery. He was then contacted by a GFH manager who requested him to attend a meeting in Dubai with the group's chairman and a number of officials to discuss a financial settlement. I was expecting to meet several elderly ministers of the UAE, government ministers, who were board members of, the, of, of that company. Um, to discuss the amounts of money that they owed me and, and various di disagreements that we had. And um, instead of that, a young man, young Emirati man, looked about 18, 19, wearing a candor of the local dress with a baseball cap on backwards, came up to me and said to me, come with me. Um, and at the time I looked at him and I thought, well, you're certainly not this 65, 70-year-old ex-Emirati Minister of Employment, so um, who are you? And he wouldn't answer me. And then all of a sudden, um, I'm in a police station, Burdabai police station, with lots of shouting. It was very hot um, and everybody screaming and shouting in Arabic and very busy in chaos, people being pushed around. The police had guns and no one's really telling me what's going on. They punched me at the back of the head and then they punch you here in the kidneys and they kicked me in the shins. And they're all areas that you see that they do repeatedly to try and avoid bruising. Um, and then they taser you. So one taser, I don't know if you've ever been tasered, but it's if, maybe if you've touched an electric fence, it's something like that, but worse. That's one. But if someone does it to you, you have four people doing it to you with separate tasers, you, you, that's it, you just, 
it's like you, you're there, but you can't move, and the pain is excruciating. So you get tasered, you fall to the ground. After that episode, I was taken out again in the middle of the night. So I was taken out to the office that I mentioned right at the very beginning, where I saw the person punching their hand like that and pointing at me. And there were senior police and junior police in there. And again, I was basically told, why have you taken money from your employer? And of course I said, well, I didn't, you know, and you know, I, I don't know why I'm here and you should just let me go and et cetera. Um, and again, they just start again, punching you straight away and tasering you. Um, and if you look very closely at my face, you'll see one of my cheekbones is higher than the other. They fractured my cheek foam from blows to the face. You can see this one is higher. Um, and that, that all occurred there. Um, they also then um, essentially sexually abused me, um, raped if, if you like, um, which was horrific. It's very difficult to talk about that. Um, and you, you know, I was covered in blood, I was on the floor, I was unconscious. And that particular, that particular episode I think went on probably for an hour and a half, two hours. Um, all the while they're trying to get me to confess, to say that I did something that I didn't do. As a barrister representing uh, David Haig, who himself is a victim of torture uh, during his period of incarceration in, in Dubai, I would evaluate his, his case on the evidence as being very strong. And that's for a number of different reasons. Um, as David has said on a number of occasions, he suffered a number of physical injuries as a result of the torture that he suffered. And of course, psychological trauma uh, as a result of what he went through. And of course, not only do we have his evidence and also the supporting evidence in other cases, but there is also a body of medical evidence that we can use in the proceedings that relate to the rehabilitation that he had uh, in terms of correcting the injuries and also the, the period in which he was held in a psychiatric uh, ward to, to deal with the psychological damage that was done to him. Well, that's a different world, that's a different Currently, culture, David that's works as a lawyer and a British businessman overseeing several internal and external investment projects. He remains actively engaged with a number of lawyers and human rights activists in a campaign aiming to prosecute the UAE in Britain and in many other countries. Today he is addressing a press conference at the Swiss Press Club in the city of Geneva in an attempt to advocate for the creation of an organisation to help the victims of human rights violations in the UAE. I can tell you that the most basic human rights are denied to detainees and prisoners in the UAE. After I was arrested, I was detained without charge or investigation for 15 months. And most of the physical abuse that I suffered occurred during this time. During my incarceration, I was denied the opportunity to see the evidence against me, either before or during the so-called trial. The initiative that came from today's press conference, where a number of victims of torture from the UAE have come together to form a non-profit association that would not only um, be able to provide a service to individuals in the UAE, um, but would also be able to provide uh, legal accountability, putting cases together, bringing cases in the Swiss courts and other European countries under the principle of universal jurisdiction on the basis that there is no redress before the UAE court, so you have to take that outside. And many of these individuals, when they're finally released, they've been through such an appalling system of abuse that it's probably not their, pr their first concern is to, is to want to deal with lawyers and a legal process. And so having an association of individuals that have been through the same level of treatment is absolutely essential. And I can't stress enough how important it is to have an environment where, where individuals can also get help for having been the victim of torture, because that doesn't go away overnight.
Retired businessman Gary Black and his daughter returned from the UAE after an exhausting humanitarian and legal crisis. His entire family was adversely affected by the problem. Not even his small granddaughter was spared. The situation occurred after his daughter obtained a job in the UAE's capital, Abu Dhabi. There, she befriended an Emirati young man who worked for a local security agency. As the relationship between them grew stronger, they got married and had a child. Gary moved with his wife to the Emirates to work and to be close to their daughter and new granddaughter. He entered into a commercial partnership with his son-in-law. However, according to Gary, when some family disagreements erupted, there was no legal and amicable way to resolve them due to the influence his son-in-law had within the policy and judiciary systems of the UAE. The abuse towards the, the child was probably one of absolute neglect. In all the times that I was ever through in his apartment, I never once saw him pick the child up. Uh, in terms of the abuse to my daughter, he was an extremely heavy drinker. Uh, every day he drank alcohol to excess. And uh, he would disappear and go to clubs in Abu Dhabi and uh, with his friends. Uh, and it was clearly obvious that he, he wasn't being faithful to my daughter. I did business with, with many local Emiratis here in, in, in my line of business in international logistics. And some I was very close to, I played golf with them and I asked their advice. I said, what can I do about this? And their advice was very clear, nothing, absolutely nothing. Under UAE law, a husband has a legal right to punish his wife. And I couldn't believe this, it's so totally against all of our principles. And I said, well, what is the solution? And they said, get her out. Come up with a plan. Get her out. That is your only solution. Gary, his wife, his daughter and his granddaughter managed to leave the UAE in stages, finally arriving in their Scottish homeland. But the problems they had with the UAE husband did not terminate there. In fact, they escalated and took a new turn. He, in my view, colluded with his family. Uh, despite the fact he knew exactly where my wife and I were, they pushed a case using his brother as a, his brother-in-law as the prosecutor, his uncle as the alleged forensic uh, consultant, and him as the complainer, to convict me of mis. You know, I think the actual charge was breach of trust and he claimed that I had uh, removed the $250,000 from his business, which was absolute nonsense. But anyway, that's what they claimed. They did all this behind my back. They never contacted me to say that they were intending doing this because I, they couldn't risk me defending it. So I was convicted in my absence. Uh, and then shortly after that followed a request for extradition. The British authorities received a request to extradite Gary Black so that he could appear before the Emirati judiciary. This was in accordance with a deal signed between Britain and the UAE over the extradition of criminals. Gary's case was the first of its kind to be looked into by a Scottish court. Apart from some minor differences due to various legislations, the Scottish judiciary is part and parcel of the British judicial system. In court in the heart of the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, the judge ruled in about 50 pages to reject Black's extradition to the UAE. The ruling represented the first clear condemnation of the UAE judiciary system through British law and acknowledged the existence of human rights violations and torture against detainees inside UAE prisons. This ruling is regarded as an important court document that talks in clear terms about what goes on inside the UAE. It is considered to be an unprecedented court document as it marks the first time that such a document was issued by the Scottish judiciary system concerning these practices. On the other hand, there are numerous transnational commercial disputes among partners of different nationalities. 
The higher the financial value of the project, the more inclined partners are usually towards stipulating in the contract that international commercial arbitration will be resorted to in order to resolve disputes. Multinational commercial disputes in the United Arab Emirates conclude in this way, whereby one of the partners just loses all of his investment. One of the difficulties with uh, business arrangements um, in the United Arab, Arab Emirates and where certain problems are, are caused, I mean, it's twofold, really. First of all, there is a requirement to have a, a local partner, which quite often causes difficulties when there is a dispute. When your partner is an Emirati, they have the ability to use the courts and they have the ability to influence the judicial process. And so you don't even have that option of going to a court of arbitration because when faced with arrest for what is a commercial dispute but classified as a criminal complaint, with an individual who's going to be thrown in jail, he has no access to lawyers, no access to the evidence, and no access to petition the courts properly for his release, then quite often these commercial disputes are dealt with in this way. And individuals understandably agree to whatever just to get out of uh, an Emirati prison. And, and, and that's where one of the, the real problems lies. It may be sufficient for you to visit the UAE as a tourist and end up entangled in a nightmare merely because a money exchange bureau suspected a banknote you had in your possession. This happened to Billy Barclay, a young Briton who went to Dubai on holiday with his family. When he went to an exchange bureau to change some currency, an employee suspected one of the banknotes and informed the police. It took several hours of interrogation, including a thorough search of his hotel room, before the police released and apologized to him. This was not the end of the story. We did, and you know, we had a fantastic holiday. It was actually one of the best holidays we had had. So we got home and I decided to book up the following year. And we went back in 2017, uh, back to Dubai, in the airport, me, my partner, my two young children. Uh, I was um, held back uh, at immigration. Um, they took me away, took us upstairs to the police station. They told my family just to go to the hotel that I would follow in an hour. And uh, I was kept in prison for a uh, further three days after that. And my family didn't know where I was. I was just um, held, in a, held in a cell with numerous other people in the Dubai um, prison. You know, with no food, no water. Um, getting little response from the, the guards or the, the police just ignoring me. We were moving away to the Ras Al and I was locked up there with just one other chap, but that was just a dark room at the back of a, a police holding facility. Um, that was just, that was the worst conditions, you know, it was pitch black, no toilet in the room, so you had to get, you're limited for toilet. I wasn't, you, you had to sort of ask for a guard if you wanted out for the toilet. So I spent thousands of pounds in that, you know, I spent tens of thousands of pounds on legal fees, living in Dubai, um, taxis, food, flights, um, accommodation, you know, tens of thousands of pounds in debts, you know, that I was promised to get back. So when we went to press, um, my partner back here was on the news. I, I hit all the, the worldwide headlines, then that's when the Dubai um, government came to see me, you know, the Ras Al Khaimah Tourism Board. Um, they came, been very helpful, you know, um, f offered me full compensation, reimbursement, um, pay all my expenses, you know, they told the media they'd pay all my expenses. They, um, when I was home, they put me on to Al Tamimi, a lawyer from Al Tamimi got in contact with me to take care of all my expenses. Um, and as soon as we gave them the letter of expenses, you know, the they sent a letter saying that they're not paying expenses. They were lying to me, lying to me all along. Billy Barclay, um, as soon as he hit the media, 24 hours later he had his passport back, whereas usually he would be stuck there for months, possibly convicted and sentenced to, um, uh, to prison time. Jamie Harron, he was there five months. As soon as we went to press and it was causing embarrassment and outrage, then the, uh, Sheikh Mohammed personally intervened in that case and ensured Jamie Harron was released within two weeks of the press coverage. Hi, my name is Jamie Harron. I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to all the people around the world 
Jimmy Hearn was another British victim of the UAE. Jimmy spent three months in prison after he accidentally bumped into a businessman inside a pub. The man accused him of drunkenness and the police arrested him on a single testimony. He was saved and released from prison only because the press reported his story. The UAE government, in my experience, cares mostly when a case is publicised. So as far as contacting them directly, yes, we have tried to contact them directly and bring to their attention particular cases that we were working on. Uh, we received no response. The only cases that we have seen uh, interve intervention, positive intervention by the UAE authorities or government are the ones that are raised in the international press and are causing them drastic embarrassment and essentially hurting their tourism and investment revenue. So if it affects their bottom line, they will get involved. And that was evidenced in uh, the two Scottish men last year. There was a time when Louisa Williams, known as Lola Lopez, was a celebrity in Dubai. She worked for a number of humanitarian causes, received several rewards, and was honored by the UAE government. Suddenly, everything changed overnight, and Louisa became a defendant, searching for lawyers and moving between a court and a police station. Louisa, or Lola, faced prosecution in Dubai because of this post on Facebook, in which she appealed for volunteers to distribute water during a marathon. The word volunteers was mistranslated into donors, and she was prosecuted for raising funds without a license. There was, there's no mention of any money in the English Post. But in the end, they found me guilty of a federal misdemeanor under federal law number nine that says you cannot use the internet to ask for money. Um, being forced to sign um, papers that I don't understand in threat of being thrown in prison permanently until my court hearing, that has to be an ethical violation because of course I'm going to sign it because I don't want to go to prison. Um, and having worked with so many people in prison, with the mothers and the babies, I, I know once you go in, you, you, don't, you don't come out. So, of course, I'm going to sign that piece of paper. But equally, I could be admitting to God knows what. I don't know what's in that piece of paper. After 10 hours of interrogation, despite signing a statement agreeing with what the authorities wanted, Louisa's passport was taken from her and her bank account was frozen. Louisa was released from detention on bail. Soon afterwards, she was diagnosed as suffering from advanced kidney cancer. Her doctor in South Africa advised her to travel to undergo an urgent, life-saving surgery. But the authorities refused to permit her to travel despite the seriousness of her health condition. Eventually, she was only able to travel following a major campaign last year and the personal intervention of the ruler of Dubai himself. Well, there was a lot of shouting. There was a lot of confusion because they didn't understand anything I was saying. Um, there was no interpreter be it from their side or mine. I, I did take somebody with me that, that was, when they called me to come to the prison, sorry, to the police station. I did take someone with me, but they weren't allowed to assist. I did ask for a translator or to contact my embassy or for somebody official to be sent down. Um, it was very frustrating because the, the, the smallest of explanations, the simplest of explanations I was trying to give to the questions I was being asked w w was not being understood. It wasn't pleasant. Um, I've never been so terrified in my life, to be honest. Sorry. It, it was a horrible experience. 
After a series of court sessions and appeals, the UAE court insisted on using the wrong Arabic translation and found her guilty of the charge of fundraising, but cleared her of profiteering and fraud. The post says, if you'd like to volunteer your time, click and subscribe. The Arabic version says, if you'd like to donate your time, click and donate. And they said I was asking for money. But I wasn't asking for money. I was asking for people to subscribe their name to volunteer at an event. There was, there's no mention of any money in the English Post. But in the end, they found me guilty of a federal misdemeanor under federal law number nine that says you cannot use the internet to ask for money. I was in and out of jail at the courthouse. So every time you go to court, you get taken away in, in shackles, um, in handcuffs, and you have to go downstairs to the jail cells that sit under the courthouse. At that point in time, that's when your lawyers basically try and get you bail. Sometimes you get it quickly, sometimes you don't. Um, but every time you go down to those jails where sort of women are held and men are held, you don't know how long you're going to be there. The investigation led us to the northeast of London. The victim this time was not a free man able to tell his ordeal and report the violations he suffered inside of UAE prisons like the other victims we were able to speak to. He is still in prison. Like other Britons, Lucas Belmont went to Dubai as a tourist, but ended up in prison. UAE authorities refused to release him on bail. We searched for his family and found his mother and grandfather, who agreed to talk to us about what happened. The release of Lucas Belmont, who was arrested in Dubai last December and has since been held inside an Emirati prison, is not all his family in London dreams of, as his family insists the charges against him were fabricated. In the hotel room there was suddenly a knock at the door and some CID officers ran into the room and grabbed hold of him and then they took his girlfriend into a different room and he was um, pushed and slapped on the chest when he tried to stop them from touching his girlfriend. And then he was handcuffed behind his back. And they wouldn't let her out of the room either. And then they took him to the... After questioning him, saying, and they were speaking in Arabic, they would say something like, you've done this, you've done this. Um, just admit that you've done this or we're going to take her where she's going to go to prison. Um, and they kept on and on on him and she, someone was in a diff um, his girlfriend was in a different room. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let her see him or him see her. He, then they sort of arrested him. The, the hotel manager was in the room at the same time that she'd said and then they took them to the police station. Lucas's story has not drawn the same attention from the Western media as previous cases before. He still languishes in prison because of what his lawyers say were false accusations. He was forced under duress to sign a confession in Arabic, a confession that was never translated into English for him. We don't know what's going to happen. We've been told so many different things that uh, it, it, it's been that he was going to be released and they were waiting for the papers to sign. He would be told this and then it would come and then they would say, oh, no, we need more time. And then, then they would say, no, they're not releasing him. There is no help offered um, in Dubai. There is no legal representation for him. Um, and that they have been to visit to, to just to make sure that he is in the capacity that he is safe. If they gave him bail right, and said, look, we get he didn't kill anyone. He didn't. He didn't destroy someone's building or anything. All, all that happened is it was a little problem uh, uh, when signing out the hotel. And so, uh, if he had been given bail and he was able to contact us in the UK, we could have helped deal with it because we'd known exactly what had happened, and that would have been fine. But no, they put him in jail. 
The suffering to which victims are subjected in UAE prisons is nothing compared to a plight of a different kind, the loss of one's life. This is what happened to Bradley Brown, a young Briton who went to Dubai on holiday in April 2011 and stayed at the well-known Burj Al Arab Hotel. Following an argument with one of the workers in the hotel, the police arrested him and detained him inside Al Burj police station, only for him to be found dead under suspicious circumstances. We tried to decipher his death. According to the UAE media, Dubai police claimed that he kept hitting his head against the wall until he died. But they changed their testimony following the post-mortem, which showed the cause of death to be suffocation while vomiting. The autopsy also showed that he had been taking hashish. I was telephoned uh, by witnesses at the police station when he uh, was killed. And the witnesses told me that they saw what happened and they saw that he was killed as a result of police brutality, that they had uh, thrown him to the floor, that they had um, uh, attacked him, that they would uh, hurt his head uh, on the ground, on the concrete, and um, that had led to his death. Now, the UK wanted to investigate what happened in the UAE, and the UAE was not compliant or forthcoming with evidence that they claimed exonerated the police of any wrongdoing. And it is up to the UAE whether or not they want to produce to the UK government the evidence that they claim exonerates their police pe policemen. They've declined to do so and we can only draw our conclusions from their lack of cooperation and disclosure of vital evidence. Lee Bradley Brown's body was repatriated to the UK a coroner's report and autopsy was conducted. Now we're at the stage where we need a, a formal and full thorough coroner's investigation. Now that takes time and we're still waiting the results. This means that the case of Bradley Brown, the Briton killed inside a Dubai police station, is still open. It is up to British judicial and forensic medical investigation to establish exactly what happened and what caused the death of this tourist while in UAE police custody. What is it that makes a country like Britain look away and ignore what its citizens incur inside a country such as the United Arab Emirates? We put this question to an NGO that monitors military ties between Britain and the UAE. I think that Theresa May and her predecessors have always been happy to put the interest of big business ahead of human rights. And we see this time and again with arms sales to the Emirati regime, which have increased significantly and are worth hundreds of millions of pounds every year. And the reason for that is because it's seen as a cash cow, because it's seen as something which the UK can do it can, uh, and something which the government wants to actively promote. And we have seen business interests being put ahead of human rights and being put ahead of democracy, whether that's in the United Arab Emirates or elsewhere in the region. But we're seeing an even closer relationship with the UAE specifically. And we're seeing all the stops being pulled out, especially as the UK prepares to leave the European Union. It feels like the government is trying to develop even closer links to the dictatorships in the Gulf. All the victims we met criticised the role of the British Embassy in the UAE and said that the official British role in their cases was negative. So we went to the British Foreign Office, which is the department concerned with this matter. We asked them for an exact number of Britons detained in the UAE in recent years, how many had been subjected to torture while held in prison, and about the forms of support the British Embassy and the British Consulate there offered to these Britons. We cited examples of British court rulings which prove that Britons have suffered torture at the hands of UAE authorities. The Foreign Office sent a written reply in which it stated, We provide assistance to all Britons overseas without discrimination. We take seriously all claims or concerns related to the violation of human rights. We pursue and adopt the appropriate measures whenever allegations are made. When considering any action, we avoid any measure that may jeopardize the concerned individual or any other person. 
When asked whether the British government allows the seizure of its citizens' passports in another country such as the UAE, the Foreign Office responded, As a matter of principle, we object to the seizure of the passport of any Briton by the local authorities in any state. We can demand the return of the passport, but we do not help Britons to escape justice when a person's passport is seized as part of legal procedures or an ongoing case, or when travel restrictions are imposed on the person concerned. We reserve the right to act in humanitarian or health cases or those related to human rights. The Foreign Office's response was too general. They refused to comment on the specific cases we monitored and that had often been reported in the British press. They declined to comment on the British court cases we referred to in our questions. We searched the Twitter account of the Dubai-based British government spokesperson who tweets quite actively. We sought to decipher the official British stance towards what is going on. We found no mention whatsoever to any of these cases. On the contrary, we found regular praise for the UAE role in these cases. This undoubtedly serves to confirm the accusations levelled by the victims at the British authorities that their cases have been neglected. We officially wrote to the UAE Embassy in London to understand the UAE's position. We said to them that as a media outlet, we would like to report the official viewpoint of the state regarding what all these victims had been saying. We wrote to them inquiring about the UAE system of adjudication. We sent them copies of British court rulings that warned against extraditing Britons to the UAE because of the risk of being subjected to torture but they have not responded in any shape or form. Many of the victims found no official support from the British or UAE authorities to enable them to exercise their right to redress the violations inflicted upon them. They have been left with no option but to voice their experiences through the people, human rights organizations, and to the media in the hope of publicizing their cases widely. We accompanied some of the victims during one of their attempts to hand over letters to the UAE Embassy in London, asking to meet with its officials. Can you take that or would you like to put it in the post box? I'll take anything. So we put it in the post box? It's a letter for the ambassador. Just leave it there. You want us to leave it on the floor? There you go. One of the reasons why we came here to the UAE Embassy today with other victims of abuse and other victims of injustice to deliver letters to the UAE, to ask for a meeting for them to discuss our cases but the cases of others. And as you saw, we were told to put the letters on the floor. They wouldn't even accept them. These are just a few examples of dozens and perhaps hundreds of Britons who have met the same fate, a plight that will be carved in their memory and the memories of many others. I wouldn't go back to the UAE, you know, I, I, I did love the UAE, I loved Dubai, I did before this happened, you know, even after the incident the first time, um, we got on with it, we had a fantastic time, um, I wouldn't go back now, you know, the laws, you can just be so unlucky, you know, mistakes happen, which a mistake happened to me, um, it was all agreed that it was a big mistake, um, but, you know, a mistake can happen and it, it ruins your life, it, it costs you tens of thousands of pounds and it ruins your life. Um, and right now I've just got to try and repair the damage that it's caused to me. I have loved so much about the UAE for so long. And now there's such 
anger and there's such resentment and there's such hatred for how I was treated when I did absolutely nothing wrong. It's a, a bit like being violently abused by your husband, but still a part of you loves them, but there's just no way you can ever trust them again. There's no way you could ever speak to them again. There's, they've hurt you so much. So I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn because I had a lovely life there until this happened. And I still don't know why they did it to me. I still don't know why. One of the things that I wanted to do is that because of the profile that I had, I wanted to, I had a lot of Brits and a lot of people would contact me and say, our family's been jailed, this is happening to our family, can you help us? And it wasn't just a lot, it was becoming so many, so many, hundreds. So I decided that what I should do is I should set up a law firm and a charity. To, so we have a charity for the people that can't afford to pay for lawyers and we have a law, law firm for the people that can. And essentially it's to help people that are suffering injustice like I was um, and there's thousands of them in Dubai. So we have a company called Sterling Haig, which is a law firm that works at helping people through the legal process in Dubai. We have a charity um, called Do Justice, which funds lawyers for the poor people in Dubai that can't afford lawyers for themselves. And we have Detained in Dubai, which campaigns for changes to the way that the UAE is treating the world's citizens. The UAE is a signatory to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. They should not be torturing citizens in their jails and that needs to be stopped by the international community. So one of the reasons why I came to Geneva um, at the UN review of the uh, UAE is exactly that, to show the world that the UAE is doing these things, they are torturing the world's citizens and they need to stop. I think that governments are aware of what the Emirati regime wants to happen um, and, are, and, are, and unfortunately are listening to them. Um, so much of the London skyline now is increasingly owned from the United Arab Emirates and there's so much soft power, there's so many visits which take place, there's so much mutual back scratching and I think so much of it is because the relationship has become one which is mutually beneficial to both governments but not to the people of the United Arab Emirates who are living under a torturous dictatorship. Britain is linked to the UAE through a close diplomatic and commercial relationship. This relationship has suffered no tension whatsoever as a result of the increased number of Britons who are subjected to false cases against them due to commercial or personal disputes. A question mark hovers over the official British position and renders it suspect. Many human rights organizations raise this issue openly when they criticize the British authorities' silence towards what British nationals face in the UAE from time to time. Human Rights Watch published exclusive information obtained by virtue of the British Freedom of Information Act outlining the plight of 34 British nationals who complained to UK officials about torture or mistreatment at the hands of UAE authorities between 2010 and 2015. This is just one view of one of the faces of the state of happiness. It portrays the manner in which the nationals of a friendly and an allied country, such as Britain, are treated.